Halliburton that one customer will misrepresent the other one for one when there are three different kinds. This will probably will make sense to some of us. A few years ago, we have it. We had it in Africa when some people had plastic pellets mixed with rice and deceiving customer. So these are some examples of food fraud that we've seen over time. So let's look at cases of food fraud globally, how we've seen it. In Africa, we've only reported about 7.3% of incidents of uh, food fraud. In the United States, we've seen almost 30% of food fraud incidents. In the UK, about 3.6%. And we've seen it globally, how many cases are reported uh, food uh, fraud cases. So let's look at the different types of food fraud. How do they happen? Number one is dilution. When you mix something with another thing to get it lower, I give an example. When you mix uh, milk with sodium hydroxide to increase yield, you're diluting it, or you put water into juice, you're diluting it. So that is a clear case of food fraud to make money or counterfeit. You're making a uh, wheat bread, you're supposed to wake wheat bread, but you are not making, uh, you're using something else to counterfeit the wheat, that is it. Or substituting, you're supposed to make soy oil, but because you know so, uh, so, uh, soy oil is expensive, you now put peanut oil inside the ingredient because of cost, that is substituting. Or mislabeling, because you know everybody wants plant-based product these days, so you put one thing and you label it in another thing. That is another case of um, food fraud. Or concealment, you have a processing aid or you have an ingredient, you have a catalyst, you have an enzyme to speed up some reactions and you are not putting it on your label, you are hiding it. That is concealment. That's another example of food fraud. Or you're stealing product from your employer and you are selling it in the gray market. That is food fraud. You are stealing products at work or you are passing it by your friend and you are now selling it in the open market. You are intentionally sabotaging your employer. That is food fraud. Or you are supposed to weigh 20 grams per pack of food for your customers. But because of you wanting to save money, you intentionally now take a five gram. You are putting 25, 15 grams and selling it at 30 grams. You are intentionally reducing your weight. That is food fraud or on improve enhancement, you are looking at opportunities, you are using ripening agent that you're not supposed to do, you are using some ingredient that you're not supposed to use just to make money illegally. Those are types of food fraud that we see. So globally, this is what we see as the different common uh, types of food fraud, which is substituting one product for another, using on approved enhancement or additives, misrepresenting something, uh, misbranding or counterfeiting, then stolen foods. I mean, this one is becoming huge that people will weigh lay trucks of food in transit and they will steal it and go sell it in the black market. Then intentional contamination of agent, putting something in that way that are not supposed to be. So let's also look at ways that even some companies are deceiving customers. Adulteration, like we said, when you are adding something that you're not supposed to add or you're introducing an ingredient that you're not supposed to introduce, that is adulteration. Then artificial enhancement, you are using processing aid, you are using ingredient, you are using some emulsifiers, some binders, some sugars that you're not supposed to use just to increase yield, uh, increase productivity, make more money. That is food fraud. Uh, use of undeclared unapproved banned biocide, removal of authentic constituents, when you know that the active ingredient in this is this much percent, but you want to make more money, so you dilute it, you add it, in, uh, dividing it to half. Those kind of things are, made, are food for the misrepresentation of nutritional value. You know, this thing only has 10% juice, but because you want to make more money, you, you put it on it, contains 100% juice. That is not right. Or it's only 50% protein, grams uh, uh, of protein, part, whatever, and you hype it up. That is food fraud. The fraudulent labeling claims, high source of protein, low sugar content, reduced fat content, reduced when you know that is not, but you are trying to label it to attract the customers. That is food fraud. The formulation of a product uh, 
of a fraudulent product, you put in extra sugar substitute to aid it more sweetener, where you're reducing the actual amount of sugar, all those things, that is food fraud. Tampering. The shelf life is supposed to be a year, but because you want to mass produce and leave it, you're putting two years, you're, or you're wiping out the code date and putting another date. Those types of things are food fraud. Theft. You are shoplifting it. You are stealing it from your employer, and you are selling it and diverting it into the gray market. Those are food fraud. Then counterfeit or overruns. So all these are ways that food manufacturers actually deceive customers. And if we look at the current statistics, it tells us that most cases of food fraud these days are dilution. That 50% is actually dilution, where you're adding something into product that you're not supposed to add. Then substitution, where you're taking something out and adding something else. Then artificial enhancement, counterfeiting, and mislabeling. So we can see that dilution actually seems like the big part of our food fraud these days. So how does, what was the current situation of products in the market that are being diluted, uh, uh, food frauded? What does it look like? We see that honey is probably one of the biggest product that is being counterfeited. We see that of all the reported uh, 15 most problematic ingredients, honey is number one. Uh, honey is part of the milk, olive oil, uh, orange juice, coffee, apple juice, maple syrup, vanilla extract, grape wine, strawberry uh, puree, and milk and milk products. So we can see that this is a widespread thing, that it's everywhere. People are trying to make money illegally. So as food processors, as food handlers, we must be conversant of this. A uh, few years ago, I used to work for a company and we discovered that we were losing products. We're losing product, we're losing product. So they installed cameras all over and started looking at what's going to happen. And we figured out that we had some employees, actually the guys that do trash at the end of the day, they'll pick products of product and they'll put it in dumpsters. And like they are going to throw away trash. And at the end of the day, they'll put boxes and boxes and boxes of product. And at night, a, box, a, a truck will come and will pick everything from the dumpster area and they were selling in the market. So what am I trying to put for that? As food manufacturers, as food processors, you need to be aware of these things and you need to begin to put processes in place where people cannot intentionally sabotage your product. Your product. Why? Because food fraud has implications. What implications? Number one, consumers trust and health. If a consumer have a bad experience from a product, that consumer is going to lose trust. He's not going to know that that product did not come from you. <coughs> so you lose consumer trust. And number, number one, then number two, somebody is making profit illegally and raises unnecessary competition. Because when you sell, when you steal a product, you could sell it cheaper. So the person that actually has your authentic one is losing money. And in the, in the black market, you are gaining money illegally. So food fraud has implications. Food fraud has negative uh, effect. So the impact has enormous. So as a food processor, you need to understand how does my product, how, what, what chance does it look like to be counterfeited? What risk do I have my product that somebody can pick it off the road and can go sabotage it? That somebody can look at my product and make a fake one. So what do you need to do? I'll go over eight things for you in the next few minutes that as a food manufacturer, you need to be able to do so I can make sure that your product is not sabotaged. Number one, you need to have a vulnerability assessment. Look at your whole operation and begin to see where am I vulnerable? How can somebody get to sabotage my product? How can somebody get to make a counterfeit of my product? For every food handler, we always recommend that you do a vulnerability assessment. How vulnerable are we? 
How vulnerable are we? How successful are we? If you need help, contact the Food Updates. We'll be happy to do this for you. But we always recommend that your organization have a vulnerability assessment done to know that how possible can somebody counterfeit my product? If you are working in a bakery and you have baked good, you need to have this done to be sure that you understand that how vulnerable are you? Then the threat assessment, that what are the things I need to be afraid of? What are the threats that exist within my products? What do I need to do? Then number three, you need to train your staff. Your employees need to know what food fraud is because your employees are your first direct defense mechanism. Your employees are your first barriers to prevent food fraud from happening to your product. So if you work with any kind of product, you need to make sure that your staff are adequately trained. Your staff are, are informed and knowledgeable about what is food fraud and how does your company become a victim or a suspect or whatever. Then you need to also make sure you work in whistleblowing systems where you have people that can help you to speak out, that when people see something, they can say something. When people understand and feel that there's something wrong, they can say, because if it feels wrong, it actually may be wrong. So you should have a whistleblowing system where when people know or feel or see or think something is going wrong, they can speak up and we can have uh, an, a system to investigate. Then you should have analytical surveillance we always recommend that every now and then companies should do surveillance activities. Just go to the market, see where your products are, look at very fact to see that is it still my original product? I mean, we've seen, seen it in Nigeria several times where somebody in uh, the back of their house, they are just bottling water or bottling a drink or making product to counterfeit the original. We always say that you do some analytical surveillance that we go out in the product in the open buy some product, go analyze it. Does it measure up to your original one? Then invest some detention technologies. Invest in detention technologies that what technologies are out there. We've got Horizon Scan, we've got also uh, fine technologies out there that you can use that can help you detect when you're vulnerable to it. Then direct intelligence, just doing some market surveillance, just doing some supplier surveillance, just doing some customer surveillance, just being in the markets to know that what is going on. The last thing we talk about supply due diligence systems, making sure that those who supply ingredients to you, those who supply raw materials, those who supply packaging materials, you follow them up to be sure that they are supplying you the best materials at any particular time. Because guess what? At the end of the day, if your product is part of a food fraud and you got it from a supplier, you won't, the customers will not know the consumers that it came from the consumer, uh, the raw material supplier. They're gonna come after you because it's your name, it's your brand that's on the finished product. So we always recommend that you engage your suppliers, your vendors, your raw materials uh, provider, so that you know what they are doing, that they are also not receiving counterfeited product, so that at the end of the day, we don't have food fraud in the market. This is a very in-depth topic, but I decided to make it very concise and very simple for us this morning to understand that food fraud is becoming big in the market. People are counterfeiting products. People are diluting product. People are substituting product. People are concealing information. But you as a food handler, you need to understand where your threats are. You need to understand where your vulnerability are. And you need to have processes in place so that people do not misrepresent your food to be what they are not for their own gain. So preventing is where you start from and making sure that this does not happen to you or the product that you handle. So it's always important to understand this. I made this very short uh, to start this uh, this evening, but I think I like it that we have a discussion. So I'll open it up for questions, questions, or discussions. If you are, you can just, okay. So if the manufacturing company has a trace to it, an ingredient that set their product apart, yes. 
No. That is not food fraud. If you had a trade secret, but it is patented, you, there are ways under, lab, under labeling regulations where you can put that other additives, or that if it's the same, but this is not. The key to food fraud is intentionally deceiving people to make money. That is why we call it economically motivated adulteration for financial gain. In this case, you are trying to prevent it. So as long as your regulation, labeling regulations allow that, that is not food fraud because it's a safe trade secret you are trying to prevent. But as long as you follow regular labeling laws, that is not uh, a food fraud. Let's keep the questions coming. You, you can unmute yourself to ask, or you can just uh, type it in. Let me ask you a question. So if I go to my regular food chain store, they are supposed to weigh me 30 grams plates of rice and they give me 25 gr grams intentionally. Is that food fraud? The question again. So if, I'm, if I go to my food chain, my food store to buy rice for a thousand naira, it's supposed to be 30 grams, but they gave me 20 grams and told me to go. Is that food fraud? That yeah, food that's, fraud. Food yes, fraud. that's food fraud. That's food fraud. Yes, that's food fraud. yes. Why? Because they are shortening me. If my drink is supposed to be 35 CL, but they are giving me 20 CL, what is that? That is food fraud. Right. So food fraud is whatever makes the uh, one party to gain illegally. When Can I ask a question, speed. please? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, good evening. Um, my question is, what if um, a company now who supplies a vendor or a company who supplies you um, stuff now, and at the end of the day, you find out that what they have, what they sent to you, or what is on their label, is different from what you get. Like what is, what you get is higher than what they have on their label. Like some companies can say, okay, oh, this is 250 grams, and you are measuring it, and you are seeing 310 grams. Is that food fraud, or what do you do in this case, please? That's not good, food fraud. Good question. So let me rephrase that question for you. And, and I'm going to use my previous example to make it clear to other people. So if I'm supposed to get 30 grams of rice for 1,000 naira, but when I get there, I got 50 grams, is that food fraud? No. Why? It's not food fraud. Uh, it's, it's not food fraud because, because a party from is end. Because, well, because they gave me more. They they are party is it's food fraud. Because, uh, is this no, no, one I don't. I don't think it's food fraud. I mean, you can go to the market and you buy commodity. The, Please, can I come them. in? Can I come? In? Let's take. We all, we all will talk. We we'll take you one. But I'm, I'm, let's say, let's enjoy this discussion. Let's take you one at a time. Can so, I come in, please? Yes. Yeah, to the question the uh, that has been posed, I think is actually food fraud How? because this is can be termed to as the substitution. Because as a buyer, if I'm a consumer and I intend buying this particular range of product, which I have that whole, oh, this is the particular percent of uh, this uh, nutrition present in this product, and you are offering me a different thing, so. Practically, it amounts to substitution because you have not actually implied what is being labeled on the product. Okay. No. Well, yeah, let's keep that no, Somebody no, else. No, 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 no. Hello, hello. You don't understand the question. I mean, okay, let's say for a bag of rice now, it is supposed to be 50 kg. And 50 kg is written on the bag. Now you are, go you are taking it home and measuring it and finding out it is 60 kg. <laughs> In, in this case, is it food fraud? I mean, and again, is food fraud supposed uh, to be one-sided uh, or is it supposed to affect the both parties? The parties, okay. Good question. So let's go back to yeah. So, uh, let's let's listen. Let's let's come in. Remember, we said remember here. Yeah. This is what characterized food fraud. Number one, 
there must be the motivation that somebody did it intentionally, that it was done intentionally. It was done on purpose. Number two, somebody is making way more than much money than they are supposed to make. And lastly, somebody is being deceived. Somebody is being deceived. So if you look at that scenario, let's look at it. Is there an intention for you to have received 60 kg instead of 50 kg? We have to know. Did they do it on purpose? Did they do it intentionally? Hello, sir. Purpose. What's intention? What's motivation? Hello, sir. Then the Hello, economic sir. gain. Hello, yes. Hello, sir. Yes. Then somebody, if somebody can help, please help me mute that person. Then somebody's big, there must be a deception. So in that case, where I'm supposed to get 50, but I got 60, then I need to find out, did they do it on purpose? If I have, if me as a, proof, as a food processor, I'm buying raw rice and they, I'm supposed to get 50 kg and they gave me 60 kg, I'm going to call them and say, hey, you gave me way more than this. Why are you giving me more than this? That's the first step. If they can tell us, oh, it's a mistake, you are not supposed to do this, then that's it. Uh, Tawu, but I'm going to go ahead. You can unmute yourself and talk. Yeah, um, I believe, um, number one, characteristic of a food code, like one of the characteristics being like intention. And every business um, is set up to make profit. If you have a scenario where you are expecting like 50 kg of rice, and um, you, after your, your process, you're having like um, 60 kg. Definitely something went wrong with the cost of production. If it's not intentional, this will have been like yeah, an error from their own um, um, setting, like their food defense uh, setting. Something might have been compromised in the process. I would still say going by the way of customer and by the way of the producer, it's actually still uh, food for because it is not what you do, what you order that you are having in the product. That's my own conclusion. Yes. So that case, the solution is that this particular example is not a care cut if it is food fraud or not because you do not know. So what you need to do is to contact the supplier. Say, hey, supplier of raw material, my vendor, you gave me fifty gay. I'm, I'm having more than what you declare. What's going on? And that is where you can now make a decision. Oh, yeah, we made a mistake. Oh, our scale was bad that day. You want to be sure that it's not one of these four categories, that it's not intentional. It's not that you're making money illegally and somebody is not being deceived or induced. So that is what is going to define, define it. But in a case where a, a, a bag of rice was 45 instead of 50, that was clear cut food fraud because they shorted you. You lost 5 kg and you paid for 50, you got 45. So that is food fraud. Hello, can I see how can, can I see ask now, please? Yes. Now you are saying, okay, in the case whereby it is 40, you are expecting 50 and um, you get 45. What if the issue too still has to do with their scaling and it wasn't intentional? How do we know it's not intentional? Exactly. Then that look at point number two. It was not intentional, then that is not food fraud. That was a mistake. Because at the end of the day, it was not intentional. There was the motivation is not there. They did not mean to do it. They just had a bad skill, a faulty skill. That falls then under the food security. Remember the four triangle that they are not making enough food for people. Remember the four quadrant we talked about the other time that they are not making food. Uh, yeah, that comes under food security, that they are not making adequate food supplies out. That is a breakdown in their food quality system. So that is not food safety. That's not food fraud. Because it was done unintentionally. Remember, we said there are two, that thing, that intentional is one of the keywords you look for in food fraud. That is true. That is true. Most manufacturers index to exceed minimum volume to avoid product from being underweight. Normally, most companies will do that. And that is where in, in statistical process control, we talk about what we call MAVs. 
might be a liable variance where you look at what's the average, the total average over runs. So that is where manufacturers make sure that they don't intentionally shortchange uh, our customers. Uh, if I want to chip it this in, it means if we we'll find out that the expected 50 kg weigh 45 kg, for us to be convinced it's full fraud, we could also place a call across to their customer service to find out on that. Does it go down well with that? Yes. I mean, you must be able to check all the boxes like I, sh I showed you. You must be able to check all the boxes that it was not done intentionally. It was not done for the company to make good excess money. It was not done to deceive you or trick you. It must check all the boxes here and you are violating a law for it to be a food fraud. It must check all the boxes. Thank you. Do we still have more questions, please? We have to see a few more minutes. So let's, questions, let's take the questions. I mean, this, this is expected to be an interactive class. So oh, the teacher lecturer thing. So like the other example I gave, I'm making chicken sausage, but because chicken is expensive and pork is cheaper, I decided to put a little bit of pork and I mixed it up and I call everything chicken sausage. Is that food fraud? Food fraud. Yes. That's food fraud. Yes, it is. That's food fraud. For it not to be food fraud, what do I need to do? You put it on the label. As what? Chicken, pork, chicken, chicken, pork, sausage. Yes. yes. So that is how food fraud was. Or if I have, I'm making uh, apple juice, but because I know apples are very expensive, so I put apple and I dilute it with water and I put other sugar in there and I put it 100% juice. Is that food fraud? Food fraud. Food fraud. 100% food fraud. Yes. 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 Because I have diluted it. Because I have diluted it. Because I have diluted it. Or because, uh, I, I mean, I like this one. You you probably will not know this. Are, this is three different kinds. These are three kinds of fish. As the customer, you might not know. But if I substitute the salmon for the red snapper, because the snapper is easy or the tilapia is easy to get, but the salmon is not. So I mix it up together and I serve it to you. But fish is fish. Now you don't know. Is that food fraud? It's food fraud. Yes. It's food food fraud. fraud and a part of food safety too. It's exactly. Food fraud, yeah. Tell me, I like that person. What's this food safety concern there? Yeah, food safety in the terms that he's adding another another uh, material into which could be allergic to the consumer. So it's a form of food safety. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you. You get that? Yeah. Because we have the threat to health, remember? Because what if that person has sensitivities to that food that you are substituting to it and it's not on the label and you're not declaring or it's not naturally occurring, then you put in the health of that person. So it becomes food safety and it becomes food fraud as well. Absolutely. It becomes food safety and it becomes food fraud as well. Great, great call out. I like it. Let me give one more example. So, I mean, look at that one. Because wheat bread is more, exact, more, more expensive and wheat bread is more profitable, but I'm using uh, regular uh, corn bread, but I'm not putting caramel color to change the color to that. That's, what's that? Food fraud. Food fraud. Food fraud. Food fraud. And, and you know, one of the common ones, because a particular brand of water is the one that is selling the most. So somebody who's going to stay in one remote area, he will collect old bottles and will be bottling that kind of a bottle in the back of his house and putting label of that big company. What is that? Food fraud. Because you are trying to impersonate the name of that big brand for you to substitute and counterfeit that product. That is food fraud. So as a manufacturer, as a processor, as a handler of food, like I said, you have to have strong market surveillance. If you know, based on your vulnerability and your trust assessment, that you've got high risk product that is very susceptible to adulteration, you need to have a system 
where you can use that is going to help you tell you what are your chances and how can you prevent that from happening. I think I saw one this that was on the social media this week where the police busted an operation somewhere where they were bottling some high-valued NSC. I think I saw it on the WhatsApp group I belong to this week where some people were locally bottling NSC somewhere this week. And I'm like, that is food fraud. Because um, and for, for that person, I said two things. Number one, you are shortchanging NSC. And number two, food safety. Because nobody knows what is, is in that bottle you're selling. And you're going to be going to a club and be singing Dorime. <laughs> you're putting food safety at risk. In you're putting safety of the safety uh, of the consumers at risk. Yes, that is another big one. Rebagging of local rice as foreign rice due to government policy. Yes, that's another example of food fraud. Because the customers are thinking they are buying foreign rice, but in, in, in reality, they are buying local rice. So that is food fraud. I agree. Oh, yes. That is actually, again, both food fraud and food safety. Food safety. And the practice by the houses that fumigate beans with sniper, other pesticide in market, be cutting. that is food, uh, uh, food, food safety. Technically not food, food safety fraud. Than food fraud though. Technically not food fraud food. because they are not deceiving you. But, they are, but food safety, because of that residue, that pesticide residue, that, that food safety, yeah. they are not deceiving you to make extra money. But they are just processing the food wrongly. So that is food safety, not food fraud. So in that case, what they are doing is food safety. It's a food safety problem, not a food fraud. They are trying to process food illegally, and it has health consequences because of the residue of that sniper that have a health effect on the consumers. So in that case, that is a food safety issue and not a food fraud because they are not gaining or illegally deceiving you. They are just trying to process food the wrong way. Let's keep the questions coming. Okay, Mr. Wale, in the absence of any other question, I want to thank everybody for starting up this year with us. We really appreciate your uh, continued loyalty and coming to our, our classes. So hopefully we'll see you in subsequent classes and I wish everyone a blessed year ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Adeni. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I thank every participant that joined us this Thank evening. you so much. I Bye. really appreciate you guys. Thank you so I much. Know You're welcome, sir. You must have enjoyed yourself. Thank you, sir, quite explicit. But please, yeah. can we get a recorded um, okay. copy of this, please? Thank you, darling. Love you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you all for taking out time from your busy schedule to attend this class. Uh, I'm still your regular host, uh, Wale Adegui. And uh, I also appreciate Dr. Dugwemi for giving that time, despite the time differences. Uh, we are about six hours ahead of his own timing, but he could create that time for us to ensure we have this beautiful class. Yeah, uh, the Food Update Consult Program, you can have it on our website, www.foodupdateconsult. The consult is K, that's .com. So we are going to have every two weeks in a month, we're going to have a virtual classes. So you can always join us. And uh, at still the same 7 p.m. in the evening, every, uh, the first and the second, I mean, the first and the third Saturday in every month. But the timetable for the virtual classes will be on our website. I will also send notices as the classes are, are, is being posted. And secondly, our physical class, for HSCCP certification. We'll be coming up May this year at our regular venue, SCCI, and the fee is still the same, despite the dollar fluctuation, it's still 75,000 Naira. 
for basic and 75 for advanced. So we will definitely in the next week or two, we'll be sending all out all the details expected, letters, brochures, to tell you more of what the food updates does. And also our yellow Six Sigma belt is also coming up in May. And our green belt Six Sigma and lean manufacturing class will also come up in May. Uh, but that way, the green class, the green belt class will only be for those that have taken yellow belt classes, whether with us or with any other organization. It's not restricted to probably, it has to be taken with us. But we want to be sure you have taken the yellow belt class because it is a prerequisite to the green belt class. So we'll look forward to a rewarding relationship and I will continue to get in touch with you regularly. Thank you for honoring our invitation. We appreciate you. We hope to see you on Saturday, January 22nd, when we'll be talking about food safety culture. Food safety culture. That's Saturday 22nd, 7 p.m. as well. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you. Do have a beautiful evening and happy new beautiful day in advance. Thank you so much. And if you have any personal questions you want to ask, you can reach me on 08055-41363, or you send us a mail on foodupdateconsult at gmail.com. 08055-413863. You can reach me on WhatsApp through that number as well. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Wale. You're welcome, my sister. I appreciate your presence. Thank you, Mr. Wale. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone. All right. You have a great day. I wish you the same. I wish you the same. Thank you, yeah. Prince. Thank you, my you. sister. <laughs>